Hello booktube, my name is Kate and this is my channel Chapter Kate. <laughs> hey, sweet girl. <laughs> what are you doing? Okay. So, I'm not sure what I'm doing with this camera. So, um, I'm pre-filming this video, um, and I'm hoping to put it up during Mental Illness Awareness Week, but we'll see how that goes. But that's the that's the plan. My dog's whining. Today I'm going to be doing a video that I've been kind of toying with for a while doing, and I hadn't quite decided if I wanted to or not. Um, but I felt that it was, you know, it was time to go ahead and do it, and I'm not, you know, there's no issue with it, so let's just do it. Okay, so this is a video, as you can probably see by the title, about my um, journey with mental illness and the way that it has sort of changed how I perceive things and affected my life and all that business. To start off, my diagnoses are um, bipolar disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. Those are my two main diagnoses. Um, at one point, I was also given diagnosis of ADHD, but uh, I don't know if that's entirely accurate or if that was an attempt to explain my anxiety and my inattentiveness and stuff like that and my hyperactivity, which is also a symptom of mania, so it's kind of hard to nail down. Um, but I know for a fact that I have bipolar disorder and PTSD. So, I don't really know where to start with this because it's really hard to kind of describe mental illness and like your journey with it when it's kind of something usually that impacts most aspects of your life. Um, I will say I first started noticing weird sort of points in my mood in middle school, like late middle school, around 8th grade, um, I would notice that there would be periods of time where I would be like super, super hyper, and the other times I was I was just kind of depressed and sad and lonely, um, and I just thought it was because I was lonely, not because there was anything wrong with me. I started to attribute it to the weather, like I would be like, oh, it's raining, so that's when I get really hyper, um, and stuff like that, and I, I couldn't really figure it out, and I also started getting really bad anxiety in middle school. Um, I had a, a dog that died of heat stroke, and so then every time it was sunny outside, I would feel really, really anxious and stuff like that, which is it's silly, but that's when I started kind of noticing certain issues with my mental health. So growing up, I had a very sort of volatile kind of environment around me. Um, I don't want to go into details about that at this point, but I will say there was a lot of loud and that at the time it was just something that was scary that happened and then I blocked it out. Scary happened and I just kind of mentally went somewhere else during that time um, because it was it was scary and my parents didn't really know how to communicate well with one another. They tried their best to be good parents to me um, but they had me very young and they were not great with communicating. So nothing could just be a disagreement it always had to be an argument and an argument in my home felt like a, a war zone honestly my environment growing up was not somewhere where i felt really safe um and at the time i didn't pay attention to that because i thought that was normal so whew, okay so then high school happened, and high school was, I mean, it was whatever. I didn't really feel like I fit anywhere. I hated myself. I hated my body. Um, I didn't know how to find my voice. I didn't know how to speak up for myself. I loved music. Music got me through most things. Um, um, I loved percussion. That was my main instrument. I would, I loved singing, and I loved percussion. Anytime I tried to do anything with, like, singing, um, like in chorus and, you know, fourth, grade like I tried to sing and they didn't let me in and then fifth grade I somehow made it and then you know in middle school I like tried out for a talent show didn't make it and then high school I tried out for these little groups led by my peers and um they would never let me in I had to make my own group so that's what I did um because I just never made it I was never like good enough for people um with my voice so a lot of my um value of myself kind of centered around my music because band and chorus was like all I had that meant something to me outside of home. But I did notice a lot of my moods were all over the place in high school. I'd have these really hyper times and it was really fun. And then I'd have times in school where like if 
I, I couldn't focus, I couldn't think straight, I would get anxious about everything, about sounds, about everything. Um, and I also noticed that, and I would start developing these like sort of habits that kind of looked like OCD if you thought about it, but um, I later found out it was kind of part of my mania. But I would, I would um, like always have to get in the left side of my desk, I would always have to sit in the very back. I would always have to like put my stuff in my desk to where it was all like parallel to each other in, in a certain way and everything was always cleaned off. Um, I would do a lot of things weird ways. Everything had to be threes and fives, which that's still kind of a thing with me. But I would kind of figure out ways to sort of control my environment because I couldn't control my environment at home. So um, I would develop those kind of things and um, my senior year of high school is also when I started to self-harm. At first it was mindless and it was just, I didn't... At first, the way I, what I did did not like register to me as self harm at first. It um, I thought it was more like a nervous tick. Um, I didn't think of it as self harm, but it would it would cause scars. It would um, hurt. It would it did what it was supposed to to me. It was a distraction, and it and it got out something that was like stuck. All that stress and depression and frustration. It got it out somehow by making me hurt. And that's kind of how I um, got by when those really intense moments hit for me. And then it, it became my go-to sort of coping mechanism. Um, something happened at school where we had this big thing our senior year. And um, this it seems so stupid when you think about it. But every year the seniors would get to have their own little, you know, um, solos during the la like the last concerts of the year. And... When I auditioned for my solo, I was really proud of it. Everybody clapped and it was exciting. But on that day, I, it, he made it where we had to vote for each other to decide who got to do their solos. And I wasn't exactly popular. So, um, I thought it was good. A lot of people complimented me. But they didn't vote for me to be able to sing. And um, so, it, since... I had been waiting for four years, you know, of that chorus to kind of get to do it. And at that point, I, what I wanted to do with my life was sing. I wanted to do that, and that was what I that was my dream, and that was what I had in my brain that, that was what I was going to do. And so then when your peers don't even want you to, it, it, like, kills you a little bit inside. And that, like, made me stop singing. It made me hate everything. It put me into, like, one of the deepest depressions that I'd ever been in. Um, at that point, um... And it was just not, it was very bad. And that's when I started, you know, um, harming myself on purpose. Like, that was when it was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do just to deal with it. And so I did. And um, obviously it wasn't, you know, the best choice. Um, I stopped singing for a long time. Um, but it was dumb. It was... I mean, I can say that, that it was dumb. It was a really dumb reaction. Um, and it seems like a dumb situation, but it was everything to me. And it was the only thing that I had some kind of control over. Something that was mine. Something that I cared about. Um, in like a... In my world. My little world that was just all over the place. And so full of anger and stress and terrifying stimuli all the time. Okay, so then I went to college and I decided to study music therapy. Um, I thought it would be perfect for me because I loved music, I loved psychology, I thought it would be cool. At that point I wasn't on anything but I, w I got put on a, um, a beta blocker which is for performance anxiety which is not what I had so it didn't obviously do anything. Um, I went to college. College brought out even more anxiety so every time I had to do like when we would do a like dress rehearsal it would be in a different building I would end up on my couch in fetal position for like three hours prior to it just feeling so sick and like just anxious because it was not in the same environment that I was used to um and I eventually went to the counselor at my college and that was honestly a lifesaver I got to actually live my life again I wasn't on the couch fetal position for three hours before anything um, I'd feel a little anxious, but it was fine. And it wasn't the performance at all. It was just being somewhere else that I wasn't as comfortable in the environment. So, um, that, she kind of suggested that I get tested for ADHD because anytime there was, like, a lot of noise, I would get really, really anxious again. And I, I couldn't think straight and I couldn't breathe and I got frustrated. Um, and so I got a doctor that put me on a medicine, um, a stimulant that's meant for ADHD. Um, so my sophomore year of college, I was on that. Problem is with that, you don't eat 
and I was just fine with not eating because, you know, starting, you know, college, I had lost like 40 pounds going into college. I never ate. Um, that helped me not to eat, not to sleep. So I was kind of sickly looking. I wasn't like healthy looking thin or anything, but I was, I looked sick. I was gray. And I would just, it was bad. And I was always, you know, never sleeping. Every time I stood up, I blacked out. And I knew I wasn't eating, but I loved the feeling of being hungry. Um, I loved... <sighs> I love when people were worried and concerned about me because it meant that I was, I looked thin for once and I didn't look giant. So I absolutely loved that. And if I really think about it, it was, it was disordered eating. It was completely, and it was assisted by the medicine I was on. Um, cause even when I went off it, I didn't want to eat anymore. And, and I hated that I started gaining weight again. And I hated myself and I hated looking at myself and all that good stuff. So, um, I continued going to the counselor regularly. Um, and then, you know, the summer before my junior year, I actually, I went to a um, psychiatrist. Was it a psychologist? I don't know. I went to, um, I went to a, a psych I think it was a psychologist. And they did sort of an assessment, and then they asked me what I was concerned about, and I told them. They said that they think I had bipolar disorder, and even though I had been studying abnormal psych and all this stuff, I had refused to, like, think about it. Because I didn't want to be one of those people that like self-diagnoses, but instead I did the opposite and I ignored all the obvious signs. You know, I was spending all this money. I would stay up for like several days in a row painting my shoes or reorganizing my room, and that had been going on for years. And um, no, and I never was like, oh, I'm bipolar. No. And so um, after finding out that diagnosis, so it seemed so obvious, and I felt so validated that what was going on wasn't quite normal, but it made sense with what was going on with my brain, chemistry-wise. Um, and then um, during some rehearsal during college the next year, uh, so people started arguing and I had a complete panic attack and um, I found out it was PTSD. I know I'm kind of just skimming over everything, but like it, that's, everything sort of happened at once and I got a bunch of diagnoses at once. And so I, tried to ignore the PTSD diagnosis because I didn't want to think of myself as traumatized because I was like, I haven't been in a war. I haven't been, you know, sexually assaulted. I haven't been in a wreck. I haven't been in anything that was life-threatening. So I tried to ignore that and invalidate my own diagnosis. And I would pay attention to the bipolar, but not the other. Uh, and then my senior year, I lost my insurance, went off five medications at once. It was a mess. I would stay up for three days at a time. I'd make myself sick because I wouldn't sleep. Um, I was still doing too, too much in college. I was doing way too much. Um, somehow I graduated. <laughs> and I was really proud of myself for doing that. I don't know how I did it, but I did. Um, but, you know, I'd get manic. And I would end up writing, like to-do lists over and over and over and over and over again like just over and over and you could tell when I was manic because I would do that and I would rearrange and I would make art things and I would write I would write choral pieces overnight and I would you know stay up doing tumblr writing all night and all this stuff and you could tell when I was manic and I liked it because I felt like I was actually worth something because I could create so it was kind of hard to get on medication but I forced myself to get on medication because my husband then Beyonce wanted me to be on medication. Um, he thought it would be, you know, better, you know, when we got married, if I was in a stable place. He was like, I think it'll be, you know, better for our relationship if you're in a good place and we're able to communicate and things like that. And I understood. I understood that completely. It's not like he was being controlling. It was more just like, hey, I really wish you would get on stuff before we got married. That way, you know, I don't end up, um, you know, I guess being unstable in that relationship and letting it affect our relationship. Um, so I got back on medication. It was really hard to find balance. I don't think I quite did because about six months afterwards, um, after finding out about my biological father and everything, I ended up having to be in partial hospitalization because I was having a lot of intrusive images of me like driving into trees and I was still hurting myself and I was, I had gone back to all of that and having constant thoughts of harming myself or ending my life or any of the above. I couldn't think straight because I was constantly having these just, you know, hurt yourself, you know, things. It wasn't like I was hearing voices. It was my own thoughts just over and over and over again. I couldn't make them stop. Um, and there was just too many changes at once. Like, the person that I was closest to at work left 
and work was already a stressful place and it was just like all these things that happened at once and I just couldn't take it and I knew that if I didn't do something to take care of myself that I was going to do something to end myself. And so I did a partial hospitalization and it was very, very good for me. Um, I think it helped a lot. I went back on medications, but eventually I stopped taking the medications again because it just, it was really hard to live a life when I felt like a zombie. Um, my supervisor at work was like, you're not bubbling anymore and kept making comments about my personality and about me not being open enough and was putting it on my annual evaluations that I wasn't open and I wasn't, you know, my personality wasn't as, you know, I don't know, I guess as warm or something because, but the thing is I was medicated, so I was a zombie. And I couldn't create, couldn't be creative for my band. I couldn't be creative for my life. I couldn't be funny. Everyone, you know, acted weird around me. I know I acted weird around everyone because I just couldn't, like, I felt like I was in a fog because it was a medication. So I ended up eventually going off everything, but I still went to NAMI meetings and I still went to my therapist appointments. Um, I didn't stop going to therapy until, like, probably December of last year, so that'd be 2017. Um... I started going to everything and just going doing work because that's all I could do. It helps that I work in mental health because I can recognize when I get bad. But that doesn't mean I'm going to ask for help when I get bad. Um, so, I'm not the best place now. But I'm better than I have been in the past. I know my warning signs. I know what, I, what to do to take care of myself. I know when I'm doing too much, when I need to take a break. Um, I don't always do it. But I also have the mindset now that when I'm in a bad place, like really manic to the point I don't feel like I'm in control or really depressed to the point where I don't feel like there's a point in anything or when I'm having like a panic attack that's just so bad that I feel like I'm going to just explode or implode or shatter into a million pieces, um, which those happen a lot more than I would like for them to when I'm out and, or at work or, you know, anywhere or if my husband breathes wrong. Um... The one thing that does help me out is the knowledge that everything is temporary. Every mood is temporary. Every, you know, every moment of panic is temporary. Every feeling of not being safe is temporary. I think that's the main thing that's kept me alive. is just that knowledge that everything is temporary. And knowing that it's a bad moment, not a bad life. Just to have those bad moments. And yes, I get very burnt out by them. And I'm very emotionally tired. And... <sighs> Sometimes it doesn't feel like it's going to end or that it is temporary, but um, I know that it is, and I think that's what's kept me going. That, my spirituality, my husband, my friends, my dog, <laughs> my family, um, all those things have sort of kept me grounded and kept me going in my life at this point. So, that's where I am in my mental illness journey at the moment. And that's why I feel like it's important to advocate for mental illness. People that have mental illness, for mental health, for education about mental health. Because stigma doesn't do anyone any favors. Stigma leads to harmful comments that take people off medications. Harmful comments that make people feel even more isolated than they already are. Stigma can lead to nothing but pain for those that are experiencing it. And pain for those around them. There's no point in spreading ignorance, and that's why I want to advocate for mental illness, and that's why I started the Green Ribbon Book Club, and that's why I think it's so important to have representation of mental illness in books and in other media. Anywhere that can help gain some sort of empathy, some sort of education about mental illness, I, it needs to be there because that's the only way to get by what's here. And even though it's expanding, there's still so much stigma in the world. But all we can do is speak up when we see it, bring light to it, and stop ignoring it. And that's all I have today. If you'd like more of this junk, subscribe below. Bye! Tripping over shadows and I'm drowning in the night I feel the soldiers coming under, pulling up a fight I feel my eyelids closing under the wind